All right. So um, after hearing the, um, the perspective of the French presidency uh, of the EU, we are now going to shift uh, to the European Commission. Uh, the next session is an interview uh, with Commissioner Gabriel, the EU uh, Research Commissioner, and the, the interview was uh, led by my colleague Florin Zubatsko, the Europe editor uh, at Science Business. I say was led because this is a pre-recorded interview that was recorded uh, a couple of weeks ago. And Florin asked the Commissioner about the state of play of Horizon Europe and what are the plans to make the life of applicants easier. So can we please roll the tape? Hello, uh, my name is Florin Zobarsko, Europe Editor at Science Business, and today I have the pleasure to ask uh, EU Research Innovation Commissioner Maria Gabriel a few questions about how Horizon Europe is going so far and what kind of fixes are needed moving towards the midterm evaluation of the program. Uh, over the past couple of months, we at Science Business have been gathering feedback from our members through a series of workshops, but also from our broader audience through an all online survey. Um, we wanted to hear directly from, uh, from them what are the main issues and concerns uh, regarding the rollout uh, of the program. Uh, and from what we hear, applicants have struggled to define their impact on their of their projects, uh, while others felt there was a lack of clarity about some of the new features of the application form. Uh, they experienced hiccups on, on the submissions platform, or they felt the 45 page limit was not enough. Uh, other respondents had to deal with uncertainties about the participation of countries outside EU or were affected by the delayed launch of some of the calls. So. Um, Commissioner, uh, Horizon Europe was supposed to be simpler, but now uh, applicants discover some parts are perhaps more complicated uh, than they thought. So first, I would like to ask you whether there will be new guidance, new explanatory material to be published that would ensure a smoother application process. And when can we expect that? Yes, there will be additional guidance. I'd like really to, to, to respond immediately. Uh, actually, uh, for us, it's, it's really, really important to continue our efforts to simplify the program and to have uh, this, this simplification as a, as a continuous process. And we must work in the simplest possible way to maximize uh, the, the impact. Uh, I must say that we appreciate feedback and the ongoing collaboration with stakeholders to, to guide us uh, in the right path. Uh, you remember one of our aims, it was to reduce the main errors of the program, and that's why we already introduced some simplifications. Remember new and aligned calculation of personal cost. Uh, yes, we have to discuss, but that was the first introduction of lump sum funding and will apply progressively. Of course, easier and simplified financial reporting requirements because financial reports will no longer be necessary with the lump sum model, for example. And this, this will be a major simplification as these reports were prone to error and consumed a lot of resources from applicants. Um, I must say that we made significant efforts to clarify how to respond to the three evaluation criteria, excellence, quality of implementation, and, and impact. And for us, it's really, again, important to continue our cooperation, our collaboration in order to improve. Uh, and actually, we are working for that to improve the drafting of our programs, the call text, because, of course, we are aware that there is still room for improvement, for example, on providing more guidance uh, to, to, to have the best advices or to communicate the novelties. But I must say that it's a process. The Commission wants to introduce use lump sum funding more widely, and uh, but stakeholders want to wait until after the midterm evaluation. So my question is, uh, how do you convince them to accept that sooner? We are aware of the concerns of the stakeholders, and that is why we, we have been testing, and testing it since Horizon 2020, and now we are applying it progressively under Horizon Europe. 
we are aware that we cannot introduce it overnight, but in step by step and after intensive testing. Because remember, we want to make Horizon Europe accessible and attractive for all participants. And in, in some particular cases, lump sums can help achieve this. What, what we have seen also with the support of the Court of Auditors is that lump sums seems have so far helped to reduce cost reporting and related financial errors. So I think that what is really, really important is to see how we can use them in a very particular situations with a lot of concerns that we should take into consideration in order to make Horizon Europe more attractive for newcomers, for small companies uh, who lack the administrative capacity and experience to handle real cost reimbursement. The necessary guidance to this end is in the pipeline and will be released in time before the next lump sum calls will open in 22. We also have a political agreement on the European research area. That's very important as well. So how is the implementation process coming along? As you know, the era policy agenda sets out 20 concrete era actions for the periods 22-24. And now what is really, really important is to see our member states by mid-2020 defining these, these actions. Member states are invited to commit by mid-22 to the actions that they will implement. And I very much hope that that will be not only few member states that will join us to actions to go forward. For implementing the era policy agenda, We'll continue our cooperation with all partners and stakeholders and hearing their voices. It is important that they tell us what they expect from, from policy makers because it was good. We established targeted stakeholders discussions, consultations, which goes beyond the forum. Good example that was the consultations on reforming research assessment. But we need to continue, and my plea was very clear with member states, they need to involve uh, our stakeholders at national level too. We'll support the European area policy agenda where necessary with the Horizon Europe work programs and foster here, of course, always national and regional RNI, RNI programs. So in the WERA forum, we'll work in the coming months to set out very clearly each action in detail and make sure that all members of the ERA Forum agree on, on, the, way, on the way forward. Uh, I have one follow-up regarding the research assessment process. Um, when should we have this new rule book for assessing excellence? Um, we know that the current assessment system is often focused on the quantity of publications in highly reputable journals rather than on rewarding the quality performance and impact of the research. Uh, it does not sufficiently take into account behaviors that foster quality, openness, transparency. I'm thinking here about the practice of open science, researchers in schools, and that's fundamental to efficient research system. So uh, here we would like to see together with, with our stakeholders how we can build the next steps because it's really really important to see that together we need to define our common approach an agreement between stakeholders forming somehow a coalition for changes would not immediately lead to a new rule book first what we would like to continue to see is that the members of this coalition will commit to principles and actions with an implementation plan, including timelines over the next few years. And during, during this period, it's crucial, all the members, all stakeholders involved should be able to work on their commitments, pilot these new criteria and processes, share their, their experience, and thereby build a reform assessment system based on evidences. So um, I must say that, uh, yes, uh, now actually what we envisage is to have this coalition that can be established in the coming months, but new rules would be implemented progressively on the, only in the following two, three years indicatively. Many stakeholders are also uh, are still worried about the uncertainty around uh, UK and Swiss association to uh, the Horizon Europe program. So what can you tell us about diplomatic progress on that front? I think that we have to differ differentiate the two cases. First, concerning the UK, again, and that was always my, my position, we recognize the mutual benefit of cooperating in science research and innovation. 
However, as you know, there are serious difficulties in the implementation of the withdrawal agreement and parts of the trade and cooperation agreement. And of course, I look forward to a prompt resolution that would allow the establishment of the association to, to union programs. Now, uh, transitional arrangements ensure that UK applicants are treated as if the UK is an associated country throughout the process, from admissibility and eligibility to evaluation and up until the preparation of grant agreements. If association is not at place at the time of grant agreement signature, applicants will be given different options to choose from depending on the nature of the call. Switzerland has been very successful in the framework programs with a very high number and quality of Swiss participants and grant Again, I repeat it, the country is also a key partner politically and economically. However, here the, the political situation should be, should be recalled. Uh, the Commission has consistently emphasized that our bilateral relations deserve better than the current lack of prospects. Uh, and that was created by, by Switzerland's unilateral decision to terminate the, the far advanced negotiations of the institutional framework agreement in the spring 21. Uh, a number of institutional and political conditions have to be taken into account before any step can be taken towards a Swiss association in the new generation of European programs. Yes, we need to see an unambiguous political will from Switzerland to work with the EU on the key issues and with a credible timetable to achieve this, what we want, pragmatic, lasting solutions that citizens and companies uh, face. So I think that uh, for our side, I can repeat, we stay open, we are here. Uh, if the work has to be done, we'll, we'll do it. But of course, we have some realities uh, on, on which we, 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 which we face and we have to take them into consideration. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. There we go. So you heard about uh, the policy and the political context, and that's going to set the scene for the rest of the day. Uh, later, we're going to talk about different aspects uh, of, the, of the Horizon Europe program. But for now, uh, I want to bring the focus back on the Science Business Network. The Science Business, ne the Science Business Network brings together more than 70 organizations across the public and the private sectors, across 22 countries, and then there are also some European and international organizations. Not all of them could be, uh, to be within the program uh, of this conference, but we did ask the leaders of, uh, of the member organization what they think were the biggest challenges that Horizon Europe can potentially help to solve. And so in the next few minutes, we're going to hear several of the uh, video, several, um, video messages from the leaders of uh, the Science Business Network. We'll then take a short break and I will be back with us at 10.15 for a session on fundamental research. <laughs> Well, I think it would be naive to think that by the end of Horizon Europe, science has been able to solve a number of the grand societal challenges. It doesn't work like that in science. But I really hope that by the end of Horizon Europe, enhanced cooperation can be seen between universities, industry, small and big research organizations, and a number of the key challenges we are facing. Climate change, the energy transition, to make our continent more sovereign from a technological point of view. That's what I hope, because where Europe works together and combines forces, we are unbeatable. Think of Airbus for applied research and industrial policy, or think of CERN for fundamental research. We should also do this in other areas, joining up, working together, and that's, I think, the role of Horizon Europe, and that's the role of the European Union. That's the European project, cooperation, and bringing the best people together. Europe needs to invest big time in key enabling technologies because key enabling technologies are the backbone of many innovations. And that's why I'm very much in favor of big investments in nanotechnology, microelectronics, photonics, quantum, because these are the areas which will underpin the big steps forward in the field of science and innovation.
I expect Horizon to provide practical guidelines for solving one of the most pressing challenges to human existence. The current unprecedented loss of biodiversity, threatening vital ecosystem services for our existence. To reverse biodiversity loss, Horizon will hopefully contribute to establish a new scientific basis for nature-based solutions that reduces these threats, such as habitat destruction and overexploitation. Implementing green energy technologies at scale requires significant areas, both on land and at sea. One significant opportunity now is to accelerate the development of the North Sea area for renewable energy generation where the nature footprint may be less than on land. We have a short window to act and need to increase collaboration between all stakeholders. I'm answering the question, in what areas should Europe invest in order to become a world leader in innovation? I actually think that this question is problematic. And I say this because it's really, really hard from a top-down perspective to pick winners. I think we in Europe should have the confidence not to over-orchestrate innovation, that we should trust in the talent and the ideas of our researchers. And we do this by simply investing in excellent science and excellent research. If we do that, innovation will just happen. It'll bubble up to the top and Europe will be better for it. Humanity is in trouble. As one of the most industrialized, but also most sustainable countries, Finland is on a mission towards carbon neutral society with accelerated time frame. We truly believe in power of collaboration, where the best innovation ecosystems are being linked to other great minds that think alike. Our strongholds in circular economy, 6G connectivity, quantum computing and cybersecurity will boost Europe in reaching its ambitious goals in stopping the climate change as well as reaching new heights of industrial productivity and technological sovereignty. Finland is ready, so let's join forces. Saving the world will be a great business for all of us. An obvious immediate problem of great significance is getting us through the COVID-19 pandemic. Another crucial problem is climate change. In both cases, we need a balance between technological solutions and social and behavioral sciences to achieve integrated solutions that are acceptable to society at large. But how do we solve these problems? Collaboration over disciplinary boundaries is going to be essential. These are multidisciplinary problems. A pandemic is a case in point. It's not simply a medical problem that is solved with medication or a vaccine. It's also an enormous behavioral problem. A close interaction and cooperation between science and technology on the one hand and the social sciences on the other hand is essential in making sure that responses are adequate, agile and robust. Broad collaboration across disciplines and nations Leveraging the collective intelligence of our communities is crucial.